So I mentioned being full, and my circuit breakers really began popping in, in my soul when I heard about mining asteroids. I was like, wow, that, that, that does blow my mind, but those are great opportunities, and, and, and I look forward to helping facilitate that. Eric, you have the stage. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Don. Uh, again, thank you to Alpa on, on the great lunch. This is the, uh, the second run-in at, at lunchtime that I've had with Alpa in about the last two weeks. And, you know, my caloric uh, intake is, is just going higher and higher. And I, I understand at their training meetings, it's, it's even worse, you know, where the pilots, you know, uh, exceed uh, certain weight limits, you know, after a few days of training because of the feeding. So thank you so much to Alpa and uh, all the, the staff for putting this together. Uh, th this is a great panel uh, because I think we really have a cross-section um, from the government perspective, from a, a policy perspective, from industry, from the operators, for the, from the air traffic controller, and then, of course, from the, the, the pilot's perspective. So I, I think we're going to have a pretty lively discussion. I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to take a, just a couple minutes to introduce all the panelists um, because it just minus the pilots in the room that have the great eyes, uh, I don't and I can't read the font uh, of all the, the, the different panelists. So I want to give them a shout out of, of some of their really, really impressive careers. I'll, I'll start with Dwayne. Dwayne has over 35 years of experience uh, in air traffic control systems, uh, starting out at the, uh, the center in Houston, I think, uh, your first gig. And, Fortunately, you're here rather than there last exactly. night. So, uh, but numerous uh, leadership positions uh, within the FAA and air, through air ATO throughout his career, which led up to his current role as the air traffic operations manager of the space operations uh, at FAA. Uh, Dwayne manages the offices focused on the integration of launch and reentry operations into the national airspace system. Uh, Dwayne has been a fantastic. Uh, host and also a spokesperson um, for ATO over out at the operations center and has hosted us numerous times. Uh, and that's part of what I talked about earlier with Joe on, on the building blocks that we need. It's the education. And you have really been just fantastic about that on availing yourself uh, on the educational piece. Jim Muncy, uh, the president and founder of Polyspace. Uh, Jim started at Polyspace as an independent space consultancy in the early 2000s uh, to help space entrepreneurs and, and intrapreneurs succeed at the nexus of the space business and technology as well as public affairs. Uh, Jim got his start early uh, on the Hill. Uh, I think he worked with Newt Gingrich as a speechwriter uh, years, years oh, ago. Oh, no. No, 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 no. He wrote his own. He didn't even have speeches, like speeches. He just got up and talked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but don't ever, I mean, don't ever credit, credit or blame me as yeah. a speechwriter for note. Right. Part of the, the Reagan revolution. Or, we or, were, or, absolutely. Yeah, not, not to date you a I little bit. I was a space guy. Yeah. Uh, and then Jim, uh, Jim worked on the, the House uh, Science Committee, uh, the Space and Aeronautics Subcommittee, and, and for a member, uh, Dana Rohrbacher, for many years before starting Polyspace. And uh, full disclosure, Jim is a, is a trusted advisor uh, of mine at CSF and helps us on, on many of our regulatory issues. So, Jim, I, I appreciate uh, you being here today. Uh, Greg Fredenberg. Um, Greg has been with Virgin Galactic, I think, six and a half years now, uh, and where his main focus point is basically the interaction with the FAA through communication and activities. Uh, he, and uh, res responsibilities for obtaining licensing and, uh, and promoting Virgin's um, reusable launch vehicle system with FAA, uh, among a number of things. And I think you come from a long history from McDonnell Douglas and Boeing, uh, where you got your, your career started, uh, and now taking flight in a different way. Yeah. So, uh, well, get to where my dream is. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. Got, got the experience on the, on the Douglas and uh, Boeing side. To, Helps me understand, right? Uh, so the, uh, the other users of the NASA as well. Awesome, awesome. Then we have Jim Ullman. Uh, Jim is currently the Director of Sp uh, Safety and Technology for the National Air, Traffers, Air Traffic Controllers Association. And uh, Jim advises NACA leadership uh, on all matters related to aviation safety, technology, and procedures, and represents NACA within the global aviation community. Uh, Jim retired from the FAA with over 25, 25 years, I think, uh, at, as an air traffic controller. So you bring that, that wealth of knowledge from being behind the screen and understanding uh, the challenges and the situations uh, as an air traffic controller to NACA. And you guys do a great job in outreach to the community. I, I've been to uh, many of your con a couple of your conferences, and they've been just outstanding. Thank you. 
And finally, at the end, in another zip code down there, I, I have uh, First Officer Steve Browning. Uh, Steve is the, the ALPA representative uh, for commercial space integration. Uh, Steve has been an ALPA member for over 20 years, is a, a pilot with, uh, with United, I believe the 767, uh, does a lot of overseas, uh, a lot of overseas uh, trips back and forth, um, but has also served on a, a number of um, ALPA panels, the safety review mitigation panel, aviation, you helped out on the ARC early on, and, uh, and also with 30 years of, of military service, you got in when you're 14, you got that waiver, so that's, that's pretty good, and just, just recently retired from, uh, from the Air Force uh, Reserves. So congratulations to you on, on that, Steve. Uh, so what I would like to do, the, kind of the format today, I'd like everyone to kind of go down the line and give a little bit of a commercial on what they're doing, what their office is doing, um, what their concerns are. I think the last panel uh, set the stage, and I think that was part of the title, but of where we're at. And, you know, and, and you know, we're focusing, taking that next step forward um, on the, the accommodation of commercial space right now and how we're all, active participants in this and, and moving the ball forward and, and it'll set us up nicely for the for the next panel on on where do we go from here, uh, so to speak. So Dwayne, why don't you tell us a little bit what's going on uh, out in Warrington, but also ATO um, and what, what your mission area is being okay. focused on. Thank you very much, Eric. Thanks to Alpa and CSF for having, having me here today on the panel. I really appreciate it. I'm really excited about this. Um, we heard on the panel this morning that SDI in the procurement process at the FAA takes a while and how are we going to bridge the gap. The, the questions were asked several times, how are we going to survive for the next five years? So that, that to me is, it was a challenge. Um, being in the air traffic world, we're more where the rubber heat, uh, meets the road. So we're trying to find procedural enhancements that we can implement right now today that are going to make things uh, more integrated and less segregated. So we've got two initiatives right now. One of them is time-based launch procedures and dynamic launch and re-entry windows. Um, the, they're both no procurement process, no new procedures, no new software. So they're really grassroots things that we can implement relatively quickly. And what I like to say is this is going to be our bridge to those automation systems that are going through the procurement process right now. So we've, we've started implementing time-based launch procedures. We're already, um, uh, my partner down there, Paul Behan, can tell you, we're already seeing benefits from that. Uh, I've got a short video here that I can uh, show you at, at some time yeah. when we're ready, Eric. But um, it, it shows you just one launch. Um, I believe it was S Hale in 2018. but. Um, just this one launch, we, we anticipate we could have saved 64% of the aircraft reroutes. We could have reduced that much. So we're really excited by that effort. And then we're, we're working with the launch industry um, on, on what are triggers within the launch windows, what are triggers within the operator's windows that we can exploit along the way. And this really started in the arc, Eric. You know, we just, just those uh, napkin writing exercises we had there. And it was Kevin Hatton and I started talking about, uh, well, SpaceX in their uh, locks load. You know, once they start loading locks, they've got to be off the pad in about 40 minutes or they, they're scrubbed for the day if the window's long. If I know that up front, if I know that T0 is locked in, I can start releasing airspace on the back end of the window. So that was really kind of a, it started changing the mindset of how we manage the airspace between that and the time-based procedures. I really see good things over the next year or two. I really see um, the ability to more integrate and less segregate while we're waiting on these automation tools to help us out. Um, I, we've briefed uh, all the industry partners on it. Uh, all the uh, FAA facilities, everybody's on board. I'm not sure, but it might be a sign of the apocalypse that everybody's on board. But anyway, <laughs> um, but no, it's, it's met with great uh, uh, excitement and anticipation. So we're really excited about that. You know, just from the time, the first time I went out to the command center to the most recent time, you see the evolution and, and the flow growing. Uh, on integrating the, the, the space partners and the launches and, and how, and the understanding from the different operators. It, it really points to uh, several of the recommendations in the ARC, ARC report and to what Mark Hopkins brought up this morning. It was that collaboration that was going on during the ARC that led to that, a lot of it. So 
I, I really think that's a key part of this, is that collaboration as we learn each other's businesses and grow from that. Do you want to run your video right now? Just to no, set the scene a little bit? When you're ready, yeah. No, yeah. Sure. Go ahead. It's the second one on there, the side by side one. So, what you're going to see here is on the right hand side our current procedures, or uh, left hand side our current procedures, and right hand side time based procedures. The blue aircraft are the aircraft that are rerouted. So, we modeled the same, the same um, launch, and you can see a dramatic reduction in the amount of aircraft that are rerouted during this launch. Picture says a thousand words and this one seemed to, to resonate with everybody. Um, but if I can come close to that, um, I think we've made really good headway. So, thank you, Eric, I appreciate and, it. And the timetable on that, what was the, the timetable of the launch window, how, how long that? I, I believe was it was like a two and a half, two hour, 45 minute window. Okay. Yeah. But you were able to manage, you're managed to, able to manage the flight the air closure much more narrowly. Much more dynamically, so. That's great, that's wonderful. So Jim has, uh, probably knows more about space policy than most people uh, will ever learn in a lifetime and, and was really at the forefront uh, of developing, actually the, the modern commercial space launch, uh, commercial space launch uh, act I think, of, was it 1984? The original right. one was 84, but I've been involved in most of the changes since the 90s. Yes, so really really at the, the forefront on, on a lot of these issues. And, um, and now as, we, uh, as we're looking with the streamlining of the, the launch and reentry regulations, Jim has really uh, played a pivotal, pivotal role on providing background uh, on where we've been and, and really where we need to go. So Jim, uh, on that note, why don't you talk to us a little bit about uh, what's on your plate, what your concerns are, and, and what gives you optimism. Well, thank you, Eric, and, and thanks to everyone uh, for having us here and, and for continuing this uh, mutual education process, which uh, I don't think is ever gonna be over. I think we're just gonna keep doing it and growing it and expanding it uh, to more and more people so that the communities can fully appreciate what each other needs, each, each industry needs. Um, I found the ARC to be amazing, just an amazing experience, staffing you uh, uh, for the ARC, uh, working with Heidi and, and uh, Mark Hopkins and uh, even Mike Cirillo at A4A. Um, it was very educational even. to us. I learned, I learned a tremendous amount about aviation. As it turns out, my father was an original FAA employee back in 1958, uh, coming over from the National Bureau of Standards where he de helped develop radars and then went into R&D at the FAA. Um, but I didn't know anything about you know, how the FAA worked. I just knew it was a big black box that I wanted to stay away from. And, uh, and I wasn't very happy when commercial space moved in there. But, uh, but, but what I learned was, you know, I learned a lot about how the airlines and the, um, the you know, business aviation operators work and what their needs are. And while I, I absolutely think we need to use safety as our, our public justification and really as an internal lodestar justification, uh, it's appropriate for us to express our needs in terms of business and, you know, with each other and, and, and understanding where we're coming from and what we're trying to accomplish so that we can be successful in our businesses. You know, one of the things that I, I, I sort of, we, we sort of hijacked the arc a little bit at the very beginning, you know, Kevin, Kevin and I did in, in that, you know, the arc original, actually the formal title of the arc is airspace access prioritization, okay? And I don't think it's, you know, unfair of me to say that there might have been some people in the FAA who thought that we could all come to some agreement as to how to manage the pain, okay? And I'm sorry, but that's not America. You know, we don't like pain, okay? We will avoid it. We will do anything to avoid pain. And so we've got to, you know, find some ways to innovate around it. And while the really smart people like Kevin and Dwayne and other people were figuring out, you know, what tools do we need, you know, to go for and things like that, I was thinking like at the sort of kindergarten level of are there some basic things we could do in this rubric of collaborative decision making to just sort of talk to each other. And because um, we've, we've got to find a way to optimize. We've got to find a way 
to not just not not just set priorities amongst users because that's not going to solve it. That's not going to allow for growth. And you know, one of the you know one of the things we were hearing early on was, well, the space launch industry is growing too fast, and you know we're going to have to put some limits on it and things like that. And I said, wait a second. As someone who's been involved in space for a long time, this is what Congress has been fighting for, and what policymakers have been fighting for and entrepreneurs have been trying at and failing at up until about a decade or a decade and a half ago, you know, reusable launch vehicles, cheap access to space, plentiful access to space. Lots and lots of launches exact, is exactly what we've always wanted in this country. So this is a good thing. But as Einstein said, you can't solve the problems that you create at one level, you have to get to another level to sort of think through what are the right solutions. You've got to move beyond. So. Now that we're accomplishing what we wanted to accomplish, we've got to figure out, okay, well, how do we work this? How do we solve this? And some of the, you know, the dumb things that we, you know, we, we worked on, I came up with was, you know, could we share schedules? I mean, the way the CDM process, capital C, capital D, capital M process works, is that the airlines and the business operators all share their schedules. And then FAA helps manage that sort of meshing of all the schedules together. Well, we aren't an aviation operator like that. We don't have that, those kind of schedules, and we won't have those kind of schedules for a very long time. But we do have launch schedules. And there's no reason why, instead of telling Dwayne a couple weeks before the launch when a launch is going to occur, we couldn't tell him a few months ahead of time. OK? Or, you know, and, and obviously, more than a two months or so is going to be very fictional. I mean, you're not going to know what it's really going to end up, what day or what, even what week it's going to be. But you can take that into account. And if you know, the airlines, one of the things I learned is that the airlines have a very, very brittle system. And what, and what I mean by that isn't, it's not a bad thing, because what they're trying to do is be as efficient as possible in managing their airplanes, their pilots, their flight attendants, their ground crew, you know, their slots, all the things, all the different resources that they have to manage to achieve a schedule, as Mark said, they've got to manage all those things, and they have little counter clocks going, you know, time, time, you know, alarm clocks going on all those things, and they work it out. And they, but they're brittle. There isn't a lot of slack in the system. So if we can tell them ahead of time, maybe you put a few extra staff on or an extra plane on this week because that's when the Falcon Heavy is going to fly, or this week you can. You can be more efficient, more frugal, and that way you can share and you can you, you can figure by talking to each other we can figure these things out. So I just it's it was a great experience for me, but we've got to come up with these short-term things as well as fight for the long-term stuff. Great. That's all I have. Thanks, Jim. Well, Greg, you guys are really at the forefront of uh, of all this. It, it started back in 2004 with the uh, the X Prize with Spaceship One. Uh, now Spaceship Two Unity will be flying imminently. Uh, you don't have to give a date right now. Uh, hold, hold off on that. But, but uh, I think all eyes are, are on you and, and New Shepard as as we launch uh, commercial participants uh, into space and you know commercial astronauts, if you will. So um, exciting time to be at Virgin. But what are some of your your challenges as well? Yeah, certainly exciting. I mean, exciting time for the industry and us as a whole, right? I mean, we just went public first uh, first. Uh, our publicly traded uh, space line, so great so that's ticker awesome. symbol. Yep, right. Uh, SPCE, S -E, you know. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, and as uh, as we ramp up, right, and we're looking to get back into flight here soon, and we have more vehicles coming online in the next uh, year or two, and and we've been talking about this airspace integration for several years, right, and I guess uh, it's time to for us as an operator to find more bandwidth to participate. Me coming to a conference like this is great, right? The interaction is great but then we, we tend to, to drift away and go back to our daily business. We really have got to start integrating and, and, uh, and talking more often and forming. You know, I look at us perhaps uh, some type of, type of a hybrid uh, CDM, right? Obviously, we're not at that uh, cadence yet where we need to be talking on a daily basis, but, but to Jim's point, right, there's no reason that we can't start talking about that when we get into commercial ops as far as, hey, here's, here's when our launch window, what's it look like to, uh, affecting those other users of the NAS? Um, we do have some of the challenges, maybe not as uh, the same as the vertical launch vehicles, but uh, 
but we do also have some of those challenges relative to fuel loading and getting off in certain times. But, uh, but we do have some flexibility to, to some of our operation that if we're talking up front, you know, and we know, we know what those weather forecasts are and the limitations are, we can still get our mission off. So I think um, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, over the next, uh, over the coming months and, and this, this coming year, right, getting more involved and starting to talk to more of the users and then uh, just sharing what our operation looks like as well. Well, you guys are a great example of how important uh, this NPRM is. You know that, you know, when we, the rules were written 20, 30 years ago, vehicles didn't look like what you have. You know, a, a capture carry hybrid, uh, you know, horizontal uh, launch landing sort of rocket. I mean, it's, it's, it's game changing what you guys are doing. Yeah, the, the regulations were not written f certainly for, for our type of operation. We play in, in many fields, right? We, we more fly like an airplane than we do a, a rocket, right? Uh, White Knight 2, the carrier plane, it's always flying like an airplane. And uh, we deal with AVS more, more than we do AST in some cases, right? Relative to depending upon our operations. <laughs> So against, uh, against those different divisions of the FAA, right, making sure everybody's informed and we're working with them is, is certainly helpful. Um, I think that uh, as, as we go through the, the regulatory reform process, right, we, we can help shape that. I think uh, making sure ensuring public safety is number one. Uh, eventually, right, uh, passenger safety, those things will come along. But I think through uh, collaboration with uh, industry and standards, right, we can, we can probably move at a quicker pace than, than uh, regulatory reform and things like uh, CSF being involved in ASTM and, and us starting to develop some meaningful uh, standards that, that are, uh, will help us with the integration into the airspace and, you know, things like calculating AHAs and, and the dynamic uh, launch areas and ALRs is, is certainly important. Thanks. So Jim, you fit into our, our tent really nicely with uh, your with NACA's commitment to safety, uh, but you're really on the front lines, you know, with what the air traffic controllers are doing uh, every day. Uh, I think 30 to 35,000 times a day, uh, and, and the, the mission that you have is is very sta uh, active, to, to say the least. Uh, tell me what you know. Uh, you're seeing on your, your your plate in the forefront, but also you know what concerns are and and opportunities lie ahead for you. Sure, thank you very much, I appreciate it. And thanks Joe and ALPA uh, for the invite and, and the partnership that we have with ALPA and NACA is extremely important. I think it gets stronger every day and it's very important that we stay plugged into each other since we are the frontline workforce. Um, you know, we are involved uh, at every level of the FA, every program you can imagine, commercial space is no difference. We have a full-time commercial space rep, Paul Behan out of, uh, out of Jack Center. Uh, we're members of the, uh, the commercial space integration team and have been for some time. And so we appreciate that collaborative partnership and relationship that we have, not just with the agency and ALPA, but with, with, with industry. So while we sit here today and we talk about commercial space, I think if we were just talking about commercial space, it would be one discussion, but we're not. Not, not from what we're looking, right? We're looking at UASs and UAVs and VTOLs and EV tolls and and all kinds of changes that are coming to the NAS. So you compound the changes to the NAS, commercial space increased activities. It's not as simple as just commercial space, at least in our eyes, right? Um, we tell our workforce, and, and granted, our workforce is hardworking uh, men and women, that this NAS is gonna be different in 10 years, and they kind of look at you like a dog watching TV, because they don't know it, we know it. Uh, you know, I, I liken this to the jet age. This is 10 years from now, this system is not gonna be anything like we see it right now. So I, I think um, there's also about 150 to 160 ongoing projects that the agency has and some sort of modernization projects were involved in that. So it's, it's a bandwidth issue, it's a workload issue, it's a training issue, it's a resource issue, um, and the complicating factor of integrating commercial space. Um, there's, there's big programs going on. Everything we're talking about has to be integrated into our in-route in, in facilities. Our in-route facilities are busy doing other things too. So I listened to the um, to, to discussion here and the, and the wish for things to happen in a quick fashion, and I'm not sitting here trying to rain on anybody's parade. I'm just saying it's more complicated than that. It just is. Um, you have a couple of large projects going on right now that affects every in-route center. You have in-route data comp. That takes an immense amount of training and downtime and two and a half days per controller for training for that. 
So you have, at the same time in our end route centers, we're replacing our ERAM equipment. We're doing an ERAM tech refresh, which is changing out monitors, uh, hardware back behind the scopes. That's going on, that just started. These are things that are gonna be going on for the next two to two and a half years. So, you know, I, I think it's important that we, we keep in mind all of these things are going on. You know, I, I am generally not, um, I don't spend a lot of time praising the FA, but I, I do praise the FA for the amount of workload that they have and the pressures that they have and the outside entities that are pressuring the agency to do things in a quick fashion. And as I talked about earlier, it's not just commercial space, it's all those other things. As far as what we need um, workforce-wise, we need controller decision support tools. That's what we need, right? We've talked about STI a little bit today, and STI is nice. It's certainly better than we than what we've had in the past, which is next to nothing. But it's still just an awareness tool. I'm talking about a decision support tool, something that goes on the controller scope, something more like an HRAM kind of thing, quite honestly. Um, um, and, and I think I think UAS and the Lance program proved that a public-private partnership is maybe the way to go on some of these things because it takes so long to get this new technology implemented. So, you know, we've been really clear uh, on all next-gen uh, uh, projects, to f see the full benefit, controllers need decision support tools, and we're no different on commercial space. We need decision support tools at the sector level. No, I, I certainly ha haven't had the opportunity to go into a, a, a tower and to see the work that the, the controllers are doing. Uh, it's, it's nothing short of remarkable, but I also think from a logistics perspective, as we talk about integrating and updating the software and the technology, w with that comes, you know, the the logistical trail of, of, of training and, and getting everyone up to speed on that. So it is a, it is a daunting task. Yeah. So. Steve, our ALPA representative, you, you, you see a lot, uh, not just from the skies, but from the ground uh, on, on working with us and uh, you know, your participation on the ARCs. So what are, what are the, the focus areas that you have had uh, the last, last year, uh, you know, integrating this whole commercial space picture with the, the pilots? The, it's been an amazing journey in the last two years for me, taken from the small little group of the task force that we're calling the Commercial Space Task Force at ALPA, to try and learn this process because yeah, this isn't necessarily our area of expertise, but we're learning, but we're also trying to apply that 90 years of experience my boss talked about uh, of safety. And that, that is so easy to walk into a room, especially with the groups that we've been in, to be able to stand on the safety mantra because that's what we're taught from day one. Because on this flying area, safety is job one. You know, it really is taking care of that passenger in the back of our aircraft, making sure they get safely to where they're trying to get to. As we go through this process uh, on, the, on, on the space piece, you know, your eyes get awake. I'm, I'm in these meetings with people that are much smarter than the average pilot, I'll say. And as we do that, you know, you can see that other perspective. And so, well, what we can do is we can bring all that experience and all that knowledge, those hard-earned lessons through all these years, uh, we are the safest transportation form, right? So let's take those lessons learned, apply it to this, oh my gosh, light speed that we're moving, uh, the, uh, the ability of the space programs to move the ball forward at rapid speeds is amazing. And, and, but we also gotta be able to pull it back you know, we talk so much about segregation versus integration, right? Segregation right now that we're using, it's fact. It's, it's that safety place that we're supposed to go to because we are mixing levels of risk. We're, we're, as we progress, we're, we need to bridge that gap from this old mantra of segregating the airspace because we weren't doing it very often, and we need to move into that next level to where we can play together in the same pool, right? We need to be able to do that, we all know that. The numbers for the airlines, yeah, we talk about how much space is growing, guess what? Airline industry is growing every day. And so we talk about the efficiencies that we've done with the airspace, you know, we're smaller and smaller windows. It's oceanic as well, you know, we went from 60 miles down to 30, now, to, now we're even closing that gap even more between aircraft. We're able to do that through the technology, but a big piece of that is also the training for not only the pilots, but the controllers and everybody in that game. If we don't have those pieces in place, we don't educate our pilots. I gotta throw out one to room over here for AOPA. You know, we talk about 63,000 people in ALPA 
And he goes, yeah, I've got 320,000 members, pilot members in AOPA. And I'm like, welcome to the game. Please come on in, let's talk about this because we can't even say that we're touching that area nearly as well as he can and voice that, that portion of it, that the traffic out there, the, the, the immense number of people that are involved in this process. Somebody mentioned earlier, you know, the millions of people that are involved with this industry, both sides of this, the commercial space as well as the aviation piece. Bringing them together, but understanding the tried and true ways can't be the way we move forward. We have to, we have to evolve. And to do that, it's going to take everybody in this room to do it because we can't do it alone. So we need to bring, come together, and this is a perfect venue for it. It gets the people, the networking, the number of business cards that have already been passed around. This is a win-win for both sides. You made a great point that you have, it, you have to have everyone in the room. And you know, just a few years ago, not everyone was in the room, and, and we weren't having these discussions. And I think this is why this is kind of a breakthrough, and I think why the arc, uh, as painful as the process was, but it was about getting everyone in the room and, and getting uh, all the right people on the bus and talking together. So I think that's a, it's a great step forward. Uh, Duane, there's been a great deal of conversation about um, regarding optimization of, uh, of airspace for, for launch and reentry activity. What, what efforts does FAA have underway to uh, kind of optimize the airspace in the best way possible? So what we talked about earlier, the time-based procedures and the dynamic launch windows, those are the things going on right now. I think that's really um, one of the perspectives I, I'm not sure that, that everybody appreciates that I like to start out with is, you know, we're coming from a paradigm where DOD, NASA launched from the Cape. We turned airspace over to the 45th Space Wing and um, we release airspace. Air traffic had no visibility into that operation. It's just release airspace at some time, hours later, you get a phone call from the 45th and, hey, you got the airspace back, and then we start running traffic again. Um, the 45th was focused on getting their mission done safely and efficiently, and, um, but air traffic had no, it was really in 2014 when SpaceX started broadcasting their launches over YouTube that we sat there and said, wow, that, that's been in orbit for an hour yet, and we're still waiting on airspace, that we started seeing there's some low-hanging fruit there, that if we just work out agreements, we've been to the 45th Space Wing, they've got the drive to 96, they want to get 96 launches. We met with the, um, the colonel down there, and I said, Colonel, I want to help you get your mission, but we're not going to do it under the paradigm we have today. We've got to do something different. So we talked about using their safety letters and their times that they use in their launch cadence in exploiting that information and building the time-based procedures. So that's right now. I wanted to mention um, also that SDI, um, we've heard industry, we've got to speed up the procurement pro process. We've gotten approval from our executives to go on a streamlined procurement process for SDI. That's happening right now. We've got a really good program manager, Ty Madden, in charge of that effort, and we're making real good progress right now. I, I hope by next year, uh, the operations, we're going to be using SDI to make operational decisions. Uh, Blue Origin, when they're in West Texas and they're coming down under a chute, I'm going to start opening airspace above that, that vehicle before it's even on the ground. We're going to be making real-time dynamic decisions based on information from SDI. So I'm really excited about that. That's kind of the next step beyond the, the, the procedural steps that we're taking. And then Jim's right. I mean, ultimately, you know, the, the, we're not there until we get something on a controller's glass. Until we get that on the controller's glass and the controller can start managing that airspace based on real-time data, we haven't gotten there yet. But I'm, I'm hopeful that with the accelerated procurement process that we've gotten approval for, that we're going we're gonna to see, see real movement along those roads. So um, I, I use another analogy also. Getting in on a controller's glass is like going from non-radar to radar. Um, is a controller, you know, you, you work off of position reports, you get from Steve or somebody calling you on a radio, and then you start managing your traffic around those position reports. It's a very archaic, slow, manual process. But if I can see that vehicle, if I can see those hazard areas, I, I, that's, a, that's a game changer for air traffic. Where was the breakthrough 
or you know the how, how is it expedited with that call from from the 45th you know when as you said you know the satellite was in orbit they're already you know broadcasting down you know and and the and the airspace is still closed and i i know um uh, Blue Origin had the same thing. You know, they, they, they shot the new Shepard up, it came back, they went out for lunch, and, and the airspace was still closed. You know, so wh- wh- I know you guys have made a breakthrough, in, you know, in reopening it. Is it just lines of communication? It's lines of communication and paradigm shifts for, for folks. You can't treat it like special use airspace. And that's our paradigm in air traffic. We treated it like a, a chunk of special use airspace and not as a timed procedure. And once we changed that paradigm, once we changed the way we looked at it, it really, but, but it was that uh, seminal moment when, when SpaceX started broadcasting that we were sitting there going, okay, I think there's something we can do better than this. So you, you brought up Blue Origin. Their uh, operation in West Texas is a great example of a, of a, a dynamic launch window. They've, they've got somewhere around a six hour launch opportunity out there. But we're, we only block the airspace for close to 40, 45 minutes because it's very dynamic. We're moving off of, of hotline calls from, from Blue Origin and we're timing that very good. So the impact of the NAS is much shorter than the advertised launch right. opportunity that, that uh, Blue's using. Hey, Greg, for you, from, from an op, again, the operator's perspective, how would VG like to see the, uh, the calculation of the aircraft hazard areas uh, standardized and implemented into the NAS? How, how do, like if, if you were king for a day. <laughs> yeah, well, we've definitely struggled with that a little bit uh, on our own as well as uh, coordination uh, with the FAA on that, right, and understanding what the, the standard inputs, right, or what, what's, the, what's going into those calculations and understanding and realizing that, you know, locations change that, but um, the, the AHAs that we have today, for us, if we're operating out of Mojave, are huge, right? And they're, they're grossly, um, they they're really could be impactful, um, and it was kind of a surprise to us when it popped up a year ago. Um, so we're, we want to get back and visit that, but I think if, uh, I think through industry, right, um, and working with the FAA, we can figure out tools, right, that, uh, that we can do real time to to calculate those aircraft hazard areas on a, on a standard basis and standard inputs to that and, and getting access to some of those tools that we don't today, that, that we can't today to, to be able to work those. Um, it's, you know, we're, we're kind of a unique operator in the fact, right, that we're piloted vehicles, so we're, we're up above most of the, uh, the other air traffic not that uh, a bad day doesn't impact what's below us, but uh, understanding our, our ability to move um, is helpful as well. So I think we've just we've really got to shore that up between industry and, and the FAA. What, the, what are the expectations for those um, areas? Okay. Jim, Jim uh, Ullman. Oh, yeah, I've got one for you coming, Jim. But um, as we're talking about what the, the, the controllers see on the screen, what they have in front of them, what information do you think the controllers most need on their on their scopes to help efficiently manage the aircraft around launch and reentry events? I think what we do right now by just blocking these huge chunks of airspace like SUAs, TFRs is certainly not efficient. Um, it's the way we've done it forever. You know, in the eyes of the controller, to me, it would be something that is a it's a moving hazard area that is dy- that moves as as time progresses and the vehicle progresses down its trajectory. This hazard area is going to change. It's going to change. And, and not only that, the ability for a controller to know what it's going to look like in two, four, six, eight minutes, right? Controllers live in the future. They're looking at this, but they're looking at where everybody's going to be four, six, eight minutes from now. So the ability at the position to be able to look at that and dynamically make decisions about rerouting aircraft based on that is it's an absolute must have, I think. Um, you know, what you have right now, and, and I really appreciate uh, Dwayne showing that video. What you have right now is that big chunk of airspace that's blocked off the coast. It has, it has some unintended consequences. All those aircraft have to do what? They have to move inland. So what you don't see is all those inland sectors are all what we call red. They're now at their maximum number of aircraft they can work. They are really working hard. They're humping hard. So the, the quicker you can alleviate that pressure, um, more dynamically you can, you can, you can do that is, is beneficial. What we also see is, right, and we were talking about this yesterday, everyone wants to know, is the airspace active? Is the rocket launched? When's it going to happen? When's it going to go cold? 
Frequency congestion it just happens over and over and over. Everybody wants to know because they're working off the old way we did business. And that is we had no them, it's gonna be closed for three, four hours. Well, things change and we have not always been real good at updating changes, I think. And then what you have on the backside of that, which I think is kind of humorous, is once the rocket does launch is, hey, we'd like, to, we'd like some S turns so we can show the passengers this plane. So it has a lot of impact on air traffic, it really does. But I think the ability to look at that hazard area and see it move and change in real time is what the controllers need. I think there's some great pictures, right, from, uh, from the uh, passenger's perspective, seeing the shuttle launch, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, so I always just thought it was not a problem if we could pull off pictures like that. You know? <laughs> so. um, hey, Steve, you know, as Joe mentioned earlier, and it's out front, you know, you guys just released your second white paper on, on commercial space uh, operations and things um, regarding the commercial space and the integration, all that. What, what do you see as some of the highlights of this new paper? I'm sure you, you may have had a little uh, ownership to some of, those, uh, some of those sentences in there. So well, tell us some of the highlights that you think would be uh, helpful to the audience. The big word, obviously, is the need for collaboration. You know, it's taking all the experience, not only in this room, but throughout this nation, to come together to fix the problem, right? Because so, we know that there's a problem. We know that we're using old generation technology and moving it, again, trying to move at light speeds. That, that qual, uh, the crawl, walk, run philosophy of don't just change it because it sounds like a good idea. I always, in my other job, talk about the good idea fairy. Just because it sounds like a good idea, it's not. You know, we, got it. we can't wait to make the mistake and then realize, man, we probably should have done our due diligence and, and done a little bit more homework on that, right? So we, the controllers is one of those areas that I've noticed with this job, very much so about making sure that that controller scope, you just don't put something on there because it's a great idea. It's gotta be tested because you, it's gotta be right the first time. It can't wait, to, you know, we can't just put it on there and then figure out later that it's, it's not working. Uh, we see that with this, uh, with the space integration pieces. You know, we need, if we do not come together with all these great ideas, talk about them in a room where you're seeing both sides of the argument. You're seeing that safety side and the innovation side as well. And coming somewhere in the middle there to talk about how we're gonna solve this problem. Uh, you know, this second paper is talking a little bit more about that international integration. We only talked about the international integration within the United States. Because now once you open that door, for the other players in the world, the international partners, right? When we do that, that just exponentially increases your problems, uh, you know, because not only are we working on the technical piece, the training piece, to making sure that our own pilots are trained properly is, is hard enough right here in this room. But to now branch out to that, uh, you know, international partners, it, we need to bring it up. It needs to be part of the conversation, and, and going forward, it's gotta be solved as well. You know, I, I use that, that training example, you know, mine is, um, uh, we, you know, what scares you a little bit? That off nominal event to me, right? We, we talk about, hey, how do we make this dynamic airspace? But I use my example, you know, from my little office at 35,000 feet, you know? What does scare me a little bit? The fact that we're talking about shrinking these airspaces down a little bit, right? But we're talking about the nominal situation, the off nominal. When I go to training at United Airlines, I train to avoid, I go out there every nine months and I practice to be able to avoid other traffic. I've never once gone to training to learn how to avoid space debris. And I don't think anybody in this room, any pilot out there has trained to avoid space debris. Part of the conversation that needs to go forward. Not a showstopper, but definitely something needs to be considered. And so, as we talk about this in, in our white paper, what we're trying to do is look at that change in airspace. That difference between having a controller actively monitoring what I'm doing, giving me, act, you know, controlling me, right? That's what they're doing in the, in the NAS. Once I go outside in international waters now, we got a great new system, CPDLC, compile, you know, controller pilot data link process. Sounds great takes minutes, minutes to get any sort of information. And in that off nominal situation we talked about earlier, you're talking seconds, not minutes. Those are the problems that we're gonna need to have to look at. And that's why this next paper is, is we highlighted some of our concerns and ways forward in the first paper. This one takes to that next level, that international piece. And just, just kind of even looking at our home area, but also you know, starting that conversation because we know the collaboration, that CDM piece, like operationally, we talked about in the ARC as well, so much 
needs to be in place because we all need to come together to make it work. Uh, you're absolutely right on the international communication and collaboration. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier about the, the uh, IAC conference that was here in town last week, you know, I sat down with the UK government and they have three or four proposed space launch, uh, spaceports uh, on uh, the island alone that they're looking at. And uh, I know we have a representative here from DLR, where's Oliver uh, somewhere, is Oliver the, the head of uh, the DC office for the, um, the German Space Agency, and we're working closely with DLR. I think you just signed uh, an MOU with the FAA um, just last week with, with Wayne's office on, uh, on the greater communication. So it's, it's something, and I'm not, not just talking, you know, going to the, the further west, uh, you know, it keeps, you know, with uh, Israel and New Zealand and everyone else looking to have a spaceport, and uh, there's, there's more conversation that needs to happen. Um, Jim, you, you assisted a great deal on the ARC uh, on, on a lot of the recommendations and, and uh, researching a lot of this, but as we came from your perspective from the ARC, did you see any, um, or, or do you want to highlight some of the near-term ideas that the ARC came up with that will mitigate uh, the conflict between aviation and space? You know, what were some of the things that yeah, you so saw there? One of, the, one of the ones I talked about already was the idea if you can share launch schedules like three months out before the airlines and, and business aviation operators have set their schedules and locked in you know, when their pilots are gonna be flying what routes and crews are gonna be flying what routes and things like that. Um, then they have a chance to adjust their you know, very fragile schedule, not their schedule, but their allocation of resources so that they have a little more give in their schedule around launch days or busy launch weeks or something like that. Uh, another that I know Dwayne's already been working on is, um, you know, up until now, there's been this very informal collaboration of process of where a launch operator talks to AST and AST talks to Dwayne about when somebody would like to launch, okay? You know, and I guess that starts X months before launch, I don't know when. but. There's actually an earlier point in the process when uh, the launch company is evaluating different launch idea dates and different launch windows and what are the right ones for the customer and they may have different options. And if those options can be tested against the CDM process so that the airlines can say, well, you know, this type of day or this, this day of the week or this whatever, is going to be especially heavy, you know, then the, the space operator has the opportunity to say, well, let's go for this one that has slightly less impact. So these are just very inform, you know, informal, but you know, they're not technical solutions, they're human solutions of, of working stuff out. But uh, ultimately what you've got to do is you've got to set up all these electronic connections, as Wayne was talking about, so that you're not drawing hazard areas on your screen with a marker, magic marker, and you know, we, we, you actually get the real time, in, real time information. I mean, we don't even have an approved real time hazard area calculator, okay? We have a prototype one that ATO funded, and we have another one for, that an, uh, an industry, and, uh, industry university team developed, and there are probably other ones out there. But we don't have, but, but the one that, that the government uses right now is, was developed, you know, eons ago uh, and takes hours and hours to run. Well, you can't run, <laughs> you can't take a multi-hour, you know, computer calculation to figure out what your hazard area is going to be and get real-time hazard information to the, to the controller. And as the rocket goes further and gets, has less propellant on board and you have certain performance information about where it is, you know, that, all that impacts what the hazard area is gonna be. So you should, you really do want that real time, almost instantaneous information put in the hands of people who can make decisions. Whether it's the, whether it's the tr controller or the pilots, as, as Wayne said on the flight deck, or back at the command center or the ops centers of the airlines. That's, that's what we've got to get to, and how we're going to get bass, you know, and, and Heidi talked about it. It's a really hard process to, to, to get a new thing installed and added to the NAT, to the NAS electronics 
And, you know, I am not smart about that at all, but we've got to figure out how to do it. Uh, what part can be done by industry? What part can be done by the government? So that, so that we give the controllers and everyone else the information they need. Uh, Dwayne, I got a question for you, but I, I see that there's one from the audience that just came up, uh, and it just says text Q, so uh, I don't know the voice from above that will read it. I guess it's Ed, yeah. Yes, uh, this question is for Jim Holman. Um, from the controller perspective, what do you see as the technical and human challenges to moving beyond segregated airspace in the management of space launches? Well, I think I think I touched on. It. I think it's I think for our workforce is bandwidth. Quite honestly, I think it's you know we've talked about uh, changes to what the controllers are seeing in on their scope, and what that means is you now have to be adapted and be able to be input into ERAM, right? Well, it's so does every single other change to in route centers, right? Could be routing, could be airspace, could be everything has to hook itself to ERAM, which, which is done via software updates, right? So now you have all these programs fighting for these software updates. So I'll be a perfect example. Um, I was talking to somebody yesterday about TSAS, Terminal Sequencing and Spacing. 22,000 lines of code are needed in an ERAM build. You're like, are you kidding? You know how long it's going to take you to schedule that? That's, that's, that's the problem I see. I think. Um, you know, controllers will do whatever you tell them to do. You give them a set of rules and a scope and a radio, they're going to do it. Just like pilots are going to be, they're going to do what they're told, right? So I don't think getting them there is the problem. I think getting us there is the problem. I think getting, getting the, the NAS there is a the problem. I think, you know, um, ABRR and PDRR, how long have we been working on that? 10 years, 11 years, 12 years? Still doesn't work. We have to get better at that kind of stuff. We have to. We have to be quicker about instituting this new technologies and getting it right the first time and, and not taking eight to 10 years to affect change. Um, I think that's very important. I think as we move forward, we've talked about it. Um, Joe talked about it this morning. It's, it's distractions in the workplace. You gotta cut down on distractions in the workplace. You do that by giving the controllers the tools to do their job, right? Right now, if you're uh, working a section of airspace and you have a rocket launch and you have to put in this airspace you have to block, it's via lat long, literally via lat long, lat long, lat long. So you gotta get better at that kind of stuff. You have to make it easier for the controller and you have to make sure that, that they're not distracted and the mitigations to the sex work are such that they can still accomplish their other job, which is separating airplanes. So, so Dwayne, the hockey stick is just gonna move uh, upwards for us. Uh, we had, I think, 32 commercial launches, 30 ish 32 commercial launches last year uh, that number is only going to increase uh, the amount of uh, commercial aviation is only going to increase uh, private aviation and, and general aviation um, so how how do you foresee the next two to five years from from the FAA's perspective on the challenges of uh, a more congested uh, airspace so, yeah, it's going to be a really interesting uh, next year. I think we mentioned this morning, I think it was Audrey mentioned, uh, you know, vehicles coming back, re-entering into the CONUS. Um, we have this, the Starlink, SpaceX is going to launch our Starlink Constellation, uh, basically a launch every two weeks. That'll double the number of launches out of the Cape next year. And um, it's, uh, it's not only that, but the smaller operators, I think you mentioned, Eric, I mean, we've got a lot of smaller operators coming online with their own needs, with their own um, operational perspective on things. So it, it's, it's going to be a real challenge. I think the tools that we're developing now, I think, are going to help us meet that need. Um, but certainly, we're going we're gonna to need that CDM-type process that, that that ability to get with industry and get the minds together because I, I, I don't see the air traffic organization doing this by ourselves. Certainly we implement, but uh, I, I need the best minds in the rooms. I need um, more thought on dynamic launch windows. I need more thought on, on the time-based procedures, but things that can really get us um, more stuff. I think there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. I really do. I think there's a, the ability to, to harness this, what we've got right now, and make make good progress. 
But it's going to be a challenge. There's no question about it. The next year, we just implemented uh, acceptable level of risk. It's a new safety standard that was implemented on October 15th of this year. That that uh, has a, a different. It's a different working pattern for controllers in the field. They they have different requirements and procedures they're going to be using. So that's a challenge to us. Um, that that's. Uh, changing the paradigm, but I think it goes back to that safety. It, it was built on building the safest operation possible. So um, I think it's a very good thing, but uh, I think it's definitely a challenge. So I, I'm excited about it. I never thought when I started 36 years that I, when I was a controller down at Houston Center, that I'd be uh, in space. So I, I'm, um, I'm really excited about it. I think the people, the folks in the FAA that are working in this arena are really excited about it. We're up for the challenge. and. Um, you know, it's going to be fun. I know we're coming in for our approach right now, so we're putting our, our, our seat backs up and our tray tables up. Uh, so in these last five minutes, I'd, I'd, I'd re be remiss if I didn't ask the audience if there's any, any questions that anyone from the audience or, uh, may have. No. Oh, Frank right there. Uh, maybe for the audience, maybe just hit the, hit the microphone. This is good. All right, so my name is Frank Spellman from CSF, so thanks for coming. Um, my question is for, for Jim uh, Muncy, but anybody else, obviously, feel free to chime in. Our plate is full right now. How do we and should we be creating policy for the future? Should we be creating flexible policy? Um, you know, there's a bunch of new entrants coming online, as you mentioned, Dwayne. Um, there's going to be vehicles that we aren't even invented yet that are going to be coming online. How should we prepare for that? I, what I'll say is, is just, I heard this morning, uh, I don't know if it was Heidi that mentioned it or someone else, talking about literally re-architecting the NAS and how we, and how we manage it entirely. Because as, as was said, you know, you develop this system around aviation, and aviation is changing, and other things like space are coming in, involved. So you've got, we've got to become more comfortable sort of fixing what we have, while we also have people thinking about what's next. And, and, and how do we, can we create a more, if we were to start today, what would it look like? And then how do you manage the transition from where we are today? That's what Newt would say. I mean, Newt would say, you know, you gotta, you gotta make it, you gotta make the, the airplanes land safely, okay? You gotta, you gotta get everyone where they're going right now. But you also have to figure out what kind of system are we going to have when you can fly on your Uber taxi or your car that turns into a plane or what or your jet pack or whatever else you know your 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 aviation equivalent of the Lime scooters okay you know how do you deal with that you can't possibly deal with that with a paradigm where you have controllers managing pilots by voice that's just not going to happen. You can't do that with everyone with like literally, you know, tens of thousands of vehicles in the air or hundreds of thousands of vehicles in the air. Okay? And I mean, that makes the introduction of space flight look like nothing. So how do you do that? I hope someone's thinking about that. Okay? I know it doesn't, I don't know one, probably very few members of Congress ask the FAA administrator every week, what are you doing to think about the generation after next? And it's unfortunate because that's, you know, that's a really important thing that somebody needs to be thinking about. So that's a great question. And I sure as hell don't have the answer. So I, I now will give the uh, prerogative to the co-host uh, and, and down the end to Steve. Uh, as an active airline pilot, uh, what significant challenges do you see uh, in the accommodation of commercial space uh, with regard to, you know, the current regulations and the policies? What? You know, what I've seen through the ARC as well as in the safety panel that I've been on is uh, we are making some changes. And uh, Dwayne brought up one of the, my big ones right now is uh, ALR, you know, uh, applying some of these principles and kind of changing what we always thought is the paradigm, this, uh, you know, one in a billion chance of failure, you know, and make, and coming down a little bit in some areas with the safety standards, but also realizing that it's still safe. So it's, it's these policies that, you know, as we, we progress, that we're changing, right? We're bridging that difference between what was 
that ultimate safely, you know, you, you stay over there, we'll stay over here, and, and we'll work that way. We know that we can't do that, just like what I was saying earlier. But as we progress, we talk about this airspace. You know, we've got to share it, we know that, but we also got to share the technology. We also got to share the procedures. And so as we see these change in the procedures, for one, need to be the same for both. And so as we're dealing with that, it's the equipage, making sure that the, the planes are talking to each other the right way, making sure that both planes, aerospace and space, are talking to each other with the same language so that we can collaborate in the decision process in that tactical environment. So in that tactical environment, I need to understand what that airspace is. We're changing the airspace, but we haven't, we changed it, but we haven't trained anybody out there on what that new airspace is on the pilot side. We, we've done it on the controllers, but the pilots are still operating under the understanding that nothing's changed. How we get that word out is, is very important. And th that's why white papers, knowledge out there, getting it out there to train the pilots is, is very important. But I think we're kind of missing some of that right now. But we can make it up, but we need to come together to make sure that we're doing it the right way. And that's, uh, again, why I say that this is so important to make sure that we're looking at it from both sides of the, of the spectrum, the space side and the, the airspace piece. But, but making sure that language of what this new airspace is called, what the procedures are, is a, m very important to me, and that's why I'm here. And, and, but I will also sing uh, thank you to the FAA for allowing ALPA to be part of this conversation because they are allowing us in the room. And that's a, the big part of it. Um, we want to be able to use our experience, use our 90 years of safety experience to be able to help this process move forward because it's gonna move and we wanna be part of that team. Well, as a pilot, you get the last word. Our clock, their time is done. I can't thank you enough, Steve, Jim. Greg, Jim, and Dwayne, thank you. This was a great discussion. I think we got a lot of the, the issues and topics out in the air, and, and I think we, we, we all still have a lot, lot work to do, but I think we, the direction is a little clearer. Uh, thank you guys great. so much. Thank you.